My name is Andrew Earnshaw. I've been married to my wife, Lauren, for uh, just over 10 years. We have three beautiful children, Jack, who's turning seven, Troy, they all turn birthdays in February. Jack, who's turned seven, Troy, who's turning five, and James, who's turning two. And so I've been uh, incredibly blessed. I work over at a place called Bible League International, which is a, is a huge blessing to work at. We reach people all over the world with the gospel and, and teach evangelism, church planner training, and teach literacy using the Bible. So it's a, it's a great blessing to work there. We are all on a journey. We're all at different points on that journey, and that's okay. I'm Steph Reynolds, Director of Partner Care for Shine.fm. The purpose of our journey is simple, but sometimes it gets difficult. Our job is to keep moving forward and to become more like Jesus. Being raised in a strong, Jesus-loving home, Andrew had a solid foundation of truth, but his personal struggles with addiction in his early adult life led him on a very difficult journey. Listen as his story of redemption unfolds. This is Shine 180, stories of lives transformed by God because of his faithfulness. Here is Andrew's story. So I was raised in a, a great home. My parents are very good parents. You know, I can say that now that I'm like 33, 34 years old. I didn't always feel that way, but I look back on my life and see how blessed I was to have parents that loved each other. And that gave us a lot of opportunities too. Um, put us through Christian school with sacrifice, you know, and uh, took us to church twice on Sundays, even if we didn't want to go, but it was, it was good. I had two sisters, um, Bridget and Carly, and I, it was a good environment for a, for a kid. So I went to a, a school called Lansing Christian in, in Lansing, Illinois, and, uh, you know, went there, went to Ileana Christian and uh, had a good upbringing. You know, I wasn't, I didn't really have many interests. I didn't know where I was going a lot of the time. And I was not a good student. I, I still do, you know, but it's by the grace of God. He, he works and uses even my, my faults, uh, but like ADD, you know, I, the report card would always say that I would get up and be standing up and be distracting others all the time. And uh, that uh, was a challenge because I didn't really care about what I was learning. I, was, I liked the social aspect, but I was kind of a class clown and never really took it seriously. And in high school, I, you know, I wondered like the, I mean, the bottom of my class here, I don't know what I'm going to do for a living. Um, I'm not good with, with my hands. I don't, I'm not good in construction or any, any trades really. So what am I going to do? And, uh, I just barely made it through high school and my parents encouraged me to, to keep going to school. I went to Purdue for a year and didn't do very well there. And I just messed around and wasted time and, uh, wanted to be with my friends and wanted to you know, they, they talk, people talk about how they partied it up in, in college. And I did a little bit of that too, but I dropped out and worked construction for a year. And that wasn't what I wanted to do either. And during that time, my wife and I started dating. So I started dating Lauren and just was so in love with her. We were friends for a couple of years and I had been anticipating and wanting to have a relationship with her. And, uh, we had date, dated different people at different times, but finally, we started dating and that was enough of a motivation to go like this. I know I'm not going to be working instruction for the rest of my life and I don't know what else I'm going to do. So I'm going to give school another chance. And I had that opportunity. I was blessed. So I, I went back to school and started doing, doing better. And um, during the time I was in school, I actually got married to Lauren and that was, uh, that was good. You know, we had been friends for so long and we had bought, we were buying a house together and I was in school. And around that time I started taking uh, prescription medication for ADD cause I, I thought I, I needed that. And, um, you know, it changed who I was and I started to just become more inside myself. You know, I'm naturally extroverted, naturally optimistic. And what that did for me, those, those prescription drugs, but ones that I abused, um, started to, started to just change who I was. And during that time we got married and my wife and I just, um, we were on two different levels, you know, and even though we had been friends, we had dated for a while, we were, we were close friends as well as, you know, 
being boyfriend, girlfriend, fiance, and now husband and wife, you know, it just, we had a first year that was really rough and she was, was depressed. I was kind of depressed and we just grew apart and we really, we really struggled, um, in that. And it, it eventually came to a head and, um, we were talking about even splitting up after that first year. And during this time, you know, I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit. I had grown up in Christian schools. I, I remember, you know, going to the altar in seventh grade at a camp, you know, and, and giving my life to Jesus. I made a profession of faith when I was 16 years old in the church, um, but I never really lived it. You know, I, I was looking at Jesus like he was hell insurance and always skeptical. And I remember sinning and just going, well, you know, I don't even know if God really exists. So it really doesn't matter that much. I wouldn't go in repentance. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go in tears trying to change my behavior. I, I really didn't care. And, um, that kind of was obvious in our first year of marriage. Cause I was really putting myself first. I was, I was thinking about what I needed and not what Lauren needed. And it, it came to a head. We started going to marriage counseling, um, and honestly, things got better. But during that time, too, rather than turning to God, I was turning to um, drinking and, and other things. And it was a slow progression. I wasn't much of a partier in high school, you know, a little bit in college, but not like every day, you know. And I remember, uh, you know, that just started picking up. And I actually got a job while I was in school at a large heating and air company in Chicago. And... Um, I had moved up quickly in that, which was great. I, you know, I found my place because I didn't think I was going to do well, but then somebody put me in sales and that's really where I, where I thrived. And I didn't, I didn't know I, I had that ability and, and that was great. And so I, I had a lot of success in the, in the first five years of my marriage. And so Lauren and I had started working through some things, but then I got this job. I had had, um, some success and I was moving up, but then eventually that job um, just became so filled with pressure. Um, I remember just like working from like six until six at night and then being on the phone all night and then being woken up in the middle of the night. And this was like a normal thing. So it was just, that was all that was on my mind all the time was work, work, work. And I was doing well and I was treated fairly, but um, I just couldn't tell that I needed God first off, but I, I also needed to set up some boundaries for myself. And I was probably like, you know, 25, 26 in that time. And so in order to turn my mind off and to be able to, to not think about work and not think about all these problems that I had, I would turn to alcohol and, and drugs. And, um, I started doing that every night and slowly I started drinking during the day at work while I was, while I was managing a bunch of people and I was able to hide it for a little while, you know, and I'd come in and, and all the problems of, of everything and all the struggles that I had would go away with a few drinks. And if I didn't overdo it, nobody could tell, you know, so it was my medication. And, um, I started doing that in the mornings, you know, and this is over a six month period of time where I really started to downward spiral It went from nights to afternoons to mornings. Like, why don't I just start off the day this way? And this whole time, I'm not thinking I'm an alcoholic. And a lot of people that have addiction problems and alcoholic problems don't realize they're an alcoholic. You know, nobody wants to say, yeah, I'm an alcoholic. And especially at 27, 20, 26, 27 years old now, um, as I'm moving through the story, I, I, you know, I have success. I'm doing well better than most people. And I never thought I would do well with anything in my life. I'm married and I have a son on the way and I just couldn't see it, but I justified it. Like, you know, people drink mimosas in the morning, you know, right. It's orange juice, <laughs> you know, so I'd mix a little orange juice with the, you know, with something and, and, and call it okay. You know, I justified all my behavior all the time. So that really, uh, just that downward spiral happened very quickly and I was able to, what I think was hiding it, I don't know how, how well I was hiding it, but for, for a while, for about six months. Trying to numb the stress and struggles of life, Andrew turned to drinking as his medication. Little by little, it consumed his days and his nights and couldn't be hidden any longer. But God placed the right person to speak truth into Andrew's life. 
So it was a quick downward spiral. And now I was drinking every day and, and hiding it. Well, I thought, and in this time, this six month downward spiral, like a really fast one. I mean, all my life was leading up to this and it slowly progressed, but the, where I started drinking every day, um, there was a guy that I worked with and he was kind of like my work mentor, but he had told me that he had been sober for 20 years at one point and we had grown close and I had told him from time to time, like, yeah, you know, I might struggle with, with addiction, completely oblivious that I was like, you know, full blown alcoholic. And he would tell me like, Hey, why don't you come to an AA meeting with me sometime? You know? And I'd be like, yeah, 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 maybe. And he, and he, and I remember even him telling me like, can you just not drink for today? And I'd be like, oh, of course I can, I can not drink for just today. And then I'd go home and then somebody would show up and next thing you know, I was drinking again. And so anyway, um, this all came to when one day I had gone into work and I had gotten some good news actually that, um, I had just had, we had just had Jack. He was uh, a month old. And uh, my boss said that, you know, we'd get insurance and all that stuff. And I used that as a, as a reason to go in during lunch and to, and to pick up a six pack of this super high alcohol craft beer. Right. And I was like, going to celebrate. These are the kind of lies that we tell ourselves. Like I'm, I'm, it's a celebration, you know, in the middle of the work day (laughs) with all these responsibilities I got going on. And, um, I, I remember sitting in my car and I just started drinking these, these like 13% alcohol beers down. And I didn't realize how much alcohol that was. Um, but I, I think I drank like four or five in like 15, 20 minutes, you know? And so I sat in my car and I was like, Whoa, you know, and I, I was just completely drunk and I went into the office and I started stumbling around and I couldn't, I couldn't like make it to the bathroom. I was like too far gone. And I, I finally get to the bathroom and I just, I, I see this guy that had been sober for 20 years out of, out of hundreds of people that work there. This one guy alone is in the bathroom and I just start crying and I just break down and I said, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I can't live this way. And, um, I have a problem. And that was the first time that I admitted to myself, um, and to somebody else that I had had a problem with alcohol. And, um, I had been using drugs and I'd been doing all this stuff. And so we, he did the right thing and he, and he talked to my boss, you know, I didn't want him to do that, but you know, what's he going to do, you know? And, and he did the right thing. And he, and so we talked and my boss said, you know, um, first off, we had no idea that this was going on, but secondly, you know, we want, we want to keep you here. So you you have to get sober, but if you don't get sober, you know, we're, we're going to have to let you go. And so I was like, oh man. So that was a wake up call for me. So the, the very next day I went to, um, my first AA meeting with, um, with my friend from work and, um, and he had, I liked the way that he lived his life. I thought he was just a really solid guy, a lot of integrity, um, just the way of looking at the world that was unique and, and spiritual you know, and I'd grown up in the church, but I, I never heard somebody talk about God the way he did. And he was just talking about how every moment, uh, even right now is completely unique, you know? And so what is there to be bored with? What is there to be scared by? You take it in as, as joy that you get to live each moment in a new way, you know, and just stuff like that. And so I started going to AA meetings and there I, I learned and, and started practicing the 12 steps. Uh, those are really life-changing things. And, and at this point, I really didn't have, a, I still didn't have a relationship with God. I didn't have much of a relationship with Jesus. I never left the church, but it just, it wasn't real for me. I knew the stuff in my head, but it wasn't in my heart. And I started working these steps. And the first step is, you know, came to believe that we're powerless over alcohol and our lives are unmanageable. Second step is to come to believe in in a power of a higher power, God. Um, The third step is to surrender our will to God. The fourth step is to, to do a moral inventory and to really see where we had harmed others, where we had harmed ourselves the lies that we were telling ourselves. And then it goes on. You eventually confess these sins. You ask God to remove these, you know, defects of character or sin. Um, and then you help others. 
And so those are the steps. And I started reading these and practicing these things. And, you know, I'd, I'd go to these meetings, but, um, you know, it was really vague, the, this higher power language. And um, that, that was helpful at first because I felt like I, I didn't have to be a certain religion to be there. But as time went on, I started to see like these 12 steps are right from the Bible. You know, the Bible must be on to something here, you know. And, and I was, I had gone through phases of complete skepticism and, and atheism in a way in my life. During my drinking, that first couple years of marriage, I just believed that if God was there, I wouldn't be experiencing the chaos that I was experiencing. And so I had really become a, a skeptic and, and, uh, a non-believer in that time. And I just believed that if God was there, it, my life would be going better, you know. Andrew recognized his life wasn't going well without God and started choosing to live out the steps of AA, which aligned with the truth he was taught as a child. Andrew stopped looking at Jesus as just hell insurance and had a life-changing transformation from just knowing the truth in his head and having it transfer to his heart. So I was really kind of agnostic to the whole thing. And I had, I had stayed that way to, to my beliefs and until I started going into AA. And then I started to see how true the Bible actually was in an indirect way. You know, it, it wasn't, you know, the church and people helped me along for sure. And I'm, you know, I'm telling a quick story here, so I'm not giving everybody credit the way that I should, because my, you know, there's people in my family and, and friends that were patient with me as I was just kind of belligerent. Um, but when I started going to AA, I just, I saw that the stuff that they were practicing was stuff in the Bible, but because they were surrendered and they had no other option, but to do these things, it was either like, okay, we either drink ourselves to death or we do what Jesus said, you know? And that's really where I started to, to go, man, this, this stuff is, this stuff must be true. You know, it, it, it much truer than I realize. And so, um, God started drawing me to himself and I started to, to talk to God more. I started to pray to God more. I started to read scripture more. And at one point I, I realized I had come to the end of where I was at and I needed to give my life more fully to God in some way. And, uh, that's where Bible league came in. And, uh, I, I didn't know how to get a job there. I didn't know what I was qualified for. I had applied three times and um, then there was some somebody I knew that had worked there, uh, an old friend, and I and I saw the perfect job come up. So I was in the sales world at at Bible League, and I was a sales manager, or not Bible League. I was a sales. I was in sales at this heating and air company I had worked at, and I was the sales manager there. And um, this opportunity came up for man, manager of the fundraising department. I was like, oh, this is this is exactly what I need to be doing. And so it'd been my third application and I contacted my friend and I was like, Hey, can you put in a good word for me? And I'd call the HR person, you know, every couple of days just to be like, Hey, where are we at? And, uh, I was 27. And so they were a little skeptical. It's like my whole team was a lot older than me, but, um, eventually God opened that door and I was able to start working there. So, um, it was, it was awesome. And, um, you know, so I had been working the steps I had been uh, working on my recovery for a while and I, I came to Bible league and it was like a fresh start for me. And I was working there for about a year, but there was still, you know, I was still looking in other areas for, for God. You know, I, I believed in Jesus, but I still was looking into other religions here and there. And I was like, man, I don't know if this is the only way I know that that Bible, that the Bible contains truth and that's good to get out here. So I'm, I'm passionate about what I'm doing but I just feel like there's, there's other ways, you know? And there was one day that I was sitting there and, um, I called this older lady of a different denomination, different faith background, but Christian into my office. And I just said, Hey, can you, can you pray just to start off our meeting? You know, nothing big. And she started praying and she always prayed with like this fire behind her. You know, she would always pray this emotionally. I came from a really conservative background. She's, yeah, you know, Pentecostal, charismatic. So she started praying and she's just saying these things. And I'm like, man, and there's something that happened in me that day where this, you know, something was happening in my chest, like a physical feeling of like, 
just this electrical current that was feeling really good in my body. And I'm just telling you the truth. This is really what was going on. And she left my office and I went, I, w- I sat there for like 10 minutes and I'm like, this feeling is amazing and I don't know what it is. And uh, I don't want it to go away, you know? And so I go back to her and I said, you know, Alice, you know, this is, uh, there's something happening inside of me and I don't, I don't know what it is. And she knew exactly what it was. So she goes, okay. And she just starts, she goes in, uh, we, we start praying together and she said, just start praising God. Just start, you know, just start praising God. And I'm like, okay, that's really weird because I don't know how to do that. But, you know, praise you, Father. Praise you, God. Thank you, God. And the next thing you know, um, I was just like, God was just moving in me. I was just praising him. You know what I mean? It, it was like a real thing. You know what I mean? And ever since that day, God has changed my life. There, After that, I just felt like God's love in such a tangible and heavy way. And it wasn't just in a moment. I mean, it literally lasted like a week where I was feeling this love, like as strong as anxiety feels in the opposite direction and how strong that can be. This was love in in the direction that was just so powerful. And I got back to my desk after that and I saw a Bible on the desk and I just felt God say, you know, this is all you need. This is what you need. You know, don't look anywhere else. And um, God just blessed me and just changed my life around. And that was about five years ago. And um, God has just put a fire in me and just shown me how, how real he is, how much he loves me, that every time I turn to something besides him, life gets worse. But when I turn to him just a little bit, life goes amazingly better. And that's been consistent. And I have seasons where I'm, where I'm more directed toward God and, and life does go better. And there's times where I try to take my own will back and, and it just falls apart in my hand. You know, it's, it's good to be around believers and even doing this right now. I mean, Shine has had such an impact on my life. We, I've been, you know, listening to that since I was a little kid when it was, you know, W O and you, and, um, and I, my mom always played it. And I, I believe that my, that my mom actually had a real impact. Cause I don't, I, you know, you hear about people that get involved in drugs and alcohol and they just never come around, you know, but I believe that God used my mom to, to pray, to, to just guide me. And even to parents that are struggling with kids that are out right now, you know, I just want to encourage you to believe that God will work, that if you raise them, you know, and, and you told them about God, even if it was imperfect, even if you did a lot of things wrong, that God is always at work in people's lives. And even when I was at my worst and when I, when I really had a feeling of hatred towards Christians in my, in my life, that God would not let me go to sleep without me thinking about him going, what if all this is true, you know? And, um, it's so important to be around believers and it's so important to, to have good influences in your life. And even as I grow in my faith now, I make sure to be listening to the right kinds of music, you know, and again, that's where shine comes in, you know, turn on shine FM, listen to, listen to the words that are being spoken over you, the truths that are out of scripture that tell you that you have a higher purpose, that, that God is watching you over you, that he's pursuing you, that he loves you, that not one hair falls from your head without him seeing that. And, um, that your life is not just supposed to be lived in this monotonous flow of work and sleep, but that, you have a plan and purpose to be his hands and feet to the rest of the world that he wants to reach others through you. And, um, you know, God has blessed me in such a way, uh, to be able to do that in my, in my work, but even opportunities like this, that come up that, that I can share my testimony and and things like that, where, where I see where God took the hardest parts of my life and the parts where I thought were completely chaos and a waste And even when I was running far away from God and trying to destroy myself, God can even take that and use it for good and use it for his plans and purposes that when we call on him, that, that he's there and ready to redeem even our most messed up stuff. God's word. Don't look anywhere else. It is all you need. The struggle with our flesh and doing our will compared to what God has for us is a daily battle but it is so worth the fight. If you're struggling with addiction and you're struggling with trying to escape the sin that's in your life and there just seems 
to be no light in that. Um, you know, oftentimes uh, the reason I turn from God and the reason I even put my faith uh, in question was because I just couldn't seem to shake what was plaguing me, whether it was alcohol or any other form of addiction, which there's so many addictions that, that we don't even realize are there. Um, I would just say to the person that's struggling with addiction that God has not left you, even if you messed up two seconds before listening to this, that he is still with you and that he loves you and that he's always there waiting for you and he can even use the bad stuff to turn it for good. So even if you're struggling and you just can't seem to get it together, know that God will never leave you, that he'll never forsake you, that he's just waiting for you to come. The worst thing that you can do is just to figure that God has written you off, that you are a lost cause, that there's no hope for you because it's just not true. I can tell as a fellow sinner <laughs> and one that sin, sins all the time still, you know, that, that, that when I turn from God, life gets worse. But when I turn toward God, life gets better. And that, um, he wants you to come to him and he wants to love you. And, and it might seem hard his way because he might put people in your life that he wants you to be accountable to Like, I can't live this life without having people in my life. And that's what the church is for. Um, you know, and we, we lose sight of that sometimes, but if I don't have my brothers in my life, um, my spiritual brothers, my Christian brothers, that, um, I can't do this thing on my own. So it might mean giving up some things. Um, and it, it might not look like your way. It might not look like God coming and just zapping you and changing you, but he will give you the way out. And we just need to listen. We just need to, to hear from him and, and just, and just sit and at the end of the day, it's, it's grace, you know, and to recognize the grace in your life and to just see that Jesus is there and that he has paid for your sins, that he loves you, that if you are in Christ, that your sins are forgiven and that we know that we have a faithful high priest that, that has taken care of it all. And it says in scripture that if you sin, turn to Jesus and, and he'll forgive you for, for your sins, that we can stand before God someday and know that we are pure and holy. Friends, God is with you. You are not a lost cause. He will use whatever is in your life for good if we turn to Him. Don't ever feel like you have gone too far. Recognize the grace of our Heavenly Father and accept Him into your life today. This was Shine 180, Andrew's story. Stories of forgiveness, redemption, restoration. I'm Steph Reynolds, Director of Partner Care for Shine.fm. Your story matters. Your story offers hope and encouragement to others. Share your story today by calling 855-987-9866. That's 855-987-9866. Shine 180, stories of lives transformed by God because of His faithfulness.